Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you may know, we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is a series on the Book of Proverbs. These lessons are for the first three months of 2015, and this particular lesson is lesson number 12, and this is the lesson for March 21 of 2015, entitled, The Humility of the Wise. The humility of the wise, that's an interesting idea. Uh, what do you suppose that's all about? This is the lesson for March 21 of 2015. As usual, we're going to ask you to bow your heads with us as we start with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we've come here to try to understand you better. We're so thankful for the wisdom that you have given us in this book of Proverbs. Help us to comprehend it to think your thoughts after you as far as possible, and to make them a part of our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's interesting. We come now to the next, to the last lesson in the book of Proverbs, and we discover something interesting, or we, we should have noted, noticed as we, as we went along. The first 24 chapters of Proverbs appear to be Proverbs collected and put together by Solomon himself. 25 through 29 are cha apparently Proverbs from Solomon, but they weren't put together until two or three hundred years later by Hezekiah and his team, and they were apparently appended to the book of Proverbs at that time. So the book wasn't put together in Solomon's day, at least not all of it. But now we come to something very interesting. In Proverbs 30, what do we have? Let's just look at that real quick. Proverbs 30, verse 1. These are the solemn words of Agur, or Agur, son of Jacob. God is not with me, God is not with me, and I am helpless. Wow. And that can be translated in other ways. Um, the Hebrew isn't completely clear, but that's one possible translation of those words. Um, what do we know about this? You all are all up to date on the latest word on Agur? No. No? Well, clearly he's a contributor to the Proverbs. He's mentioned only in this verse. We have no other references to him anywhere. The Septuagint and the Vulgate renderings even suggest uncertainty that this is a proper name. It might be something having, it might have some special meaning and not be an actual name of somebody. And by the way, as, as we usually say, uh, the materials we use in this class are available if you would like to use them for your class they're available online at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X, dot O-R-G. And help yourself to anything you find there. Hopefully it's useful. Well, let's, that was the comments from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Let's, let's look at uh, some other choices here. Um, this is now from the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary. Cohen cited a midrash, now this is a Jewish writing, that identified Agar as Solomon, the one who stored up, coming from the word Hagar, did wisdom, and Mkwa spewed out Hikka for Jekah, Jekah by taking many wives. Another ancient view of the passage understood Agar allegorically, that is, as a reference to Solomon, and saw Jacob as David, apparently, so this, some would say that that Agur was Solomon and Jacob was David. Apparently the Vulgate translation Hagur as a passive participle, hence the assembler. So Agur could mean the one who put things together. An appellative rather than a proper name. The Septuagint renders, reads fear, my words based on the Hebrew gur or tegur, from gur to dread. So there are several possibilities and I think we'll probably stop speculating beyond that. <clears throat> now this is interesting. Agar, which could mean the assembler, mm -hmm. the one who stored up wisdom and spewed it out <coughs> by taking many wives. Mm -hmm. Are they saying that he was wise, but when he took many wives he spewed, he no longer was wise? Kind of sounds like it, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, whoever this Agar was, he had a clear message about humility in this chapter. He wrote just this one chapter. 
What do we know from earlier parts of the Bible about humility? Teachable. Any great examples of humility? Jesus. Well, that would be a long time later. Moses. Moses. Oh. Look at Numbers 12, verse 3. Moses was a humble man, more humble than anyone else on earth. Written by Moses. Written by <laughs> Moses. Was he what does that mean? I've got a question here. Was he always that way? No. I mean, he had to get out because he murdered somebody, so he obviously got up in a bit of a temper. You think as he was a young man and being trained to be Pharaoh in Egypt, he was very humble? I don't think so. I think that had something to do with spending 40 years in well, the desert with sheep. Well, I do too, but I wondered about his basic personality, not so much about Pharaoh yeah. at all. I think he was a hot-tempered lad who needed <laughs> some desert air to clear his brain. <laughs> okay, the desert air. Maybe we all need some desert air. Huh? <laughs> well, uh, Elijah, would you consider him humble? Elijah? Mm -hmm. Because towards the end of time, no. there's going to be the Elijah message. Yeah. Well, so. when you see somebody that's humble, um, what are they going to be like? Well, let me ask you a very specific question. We're talking about leaders. We're talking about kings. We're talking about Moses, who was a great leader. Would you, if you had a choice, would you choose a humble person as a leader? As opposed to a guy that says, I don't care what you think. I, you, you, I'm going to do it this way or else I'm going to... When, when it comes time to choose members of Congress or the president, do you choose the humblest one? No, you want somebody aggressive who's going to... Well, going back to my question, what, what is a person that isn't humble? What do they look like? Aggressive? I mean, aggressive. the word... Self-assured? I think... They're not teachable, are they? Not very I mean, teachable. They're kind of hard-headed. We tend to denigrate the word humble, but I think being humble doesn't necessarily mean you lose the Weak. stiffened spine yeah. with an iron rod yeah. in it somewhere. So it took Moses 40 years to have his paradigm shift mm -hmm. with yes. the sheep in the wilderness. How long did it take Saul slash Paul? Yeah. Was it seven years or three, three years? years? Three years. Apparently. Well, 700 years after Moses, approximately, Micah, in a time of crisis, wrote these words, No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. What does it mean to live in com humble fellowship with our God? A willingness to listen and take instruction. Yeah, following him. Humble fellowship. Maybe we need to define humble. Help you, you know, help us out. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, another word for that would be meek. Yeah. Uh, Jesus talked about the meek. Blessed are the meek. Is uh, that a color? What? Is, Is that it a, a color? color? No. <laughs> meek. I always, that word's always amazed me. I just... There's no meaning just automatically tied to it. Oh, mm -hmm. Does humble mean that you do not think you're better than anyone else? Presumably. Meek to me means more, and I'm not trying to be funny here, more mousy. Mm -hmm. Humble doesn't convey that meaning to me. Yeah. Humble, I think, in, in godly terms, means you're willing to serve others. I think that's what God's love is all about. You've heard this story before, but let me just repeat it. There's a story told, and this is a, obviously a, a story to illustrate a point, about the man who died and or showed up at the pearly gates, and, and St. Peter at the pearly gates says, well, is there anything I can do for you before you come in here? Because once you get in here, you don't go back out again. And the guy said, well, yeah, I've always really wondered what that other hot place was like. And the guy, and so Peter says, well, I'll give you a guide and he'll take you down there and you can see. So he goes down there and he looks there and he arrives in, in hell. And here are these people wandering around and they look absolutely awful. I mean, their skin and bones and they're, they look terrible and there's, you know, they, they just, like you, you know, it just repulses you even to look at them. And while he's standing there wondering whether he should run, here's a bell. And he said to his guide, he said, well, what was that? He says, that's the dinner bell. He says, the dinner bell 
These people don't look like they've eaten anything for years. And the guy says, well, come and we'll watch. So they went over there, and lo and behold, here's this long building, and there's a few doors, and at the door there are people standing, and as you go in the door, you have to put your arms out, and they put tubes around your arms so you can't bend your elbows. And these people rush in there, and here's all this beautiful table set out with the most beautiful food, fresh fruit, and all kinds of stuff, and here they are. And after a while, the bell rings again, and they all leave, and nobody's had anything to eat. He says, this guy said, man, that's awful. Let's get out of here. So they arrive at the pretty gate again, and he goes in, and a little while later, he hears a bell ringing. He says, what was that? He says, that's the dinner bell. And he goes, and lo and behold, here's this long building, and there's doors, and there's people there. And lo and behold, as you walk in, there's people putting things about your arms so you can't bend your elbows. And what do they do? Well, it turns out that there's a long table and there's people sitting on both sides and everybody's picking up and they're feeding the people the other. on the other side. Yeah, yeah. And they look perfectly healthy. They're fine. They have a problem. By serving the others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being unselfish. Yes. Well, Jesus supported this same idea of, of humility in Matthew 18, 4. You remember, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who humbles himself and becomes like this little child. What does that mean? What's the mo most important characteristic of a child? Capacity Obedient. to grow. His capacity to grow. Mm -hmm. Mentally, physically, socially, and spiritually. That's the most important characteristic of a child. That they love to learn. Yeah. Well, is there anything that we can boast about? We shouldn't forget about Jeremiah 9. Now, I'll have to admit this is not in the, in, in the lesson that you got from your quarterly. Uh, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. The Lord says, The wise should not boast of their wisdom, nor the strong of their strength, nor the rich of their wealth. If anyone wants to boast, he should boast that he knows and understands me, because my love is constant, and I do what is just and right. These are the things that please me, I, the Lord, have spoken. So there are some things we can boast about, right? Knowing God. It's impossible to find anything better to boast about than our God. He is the creator, the savior, and the sustainer of all that is. Let's look at some verses. Look at Acts 17. Here's Paul's sermon to the, to the Athenians. Verse 25 says, Nor does he, of course talking about God, need anything that we can supply by working for him, since it is he who himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. And if you drop down to verse 28, it's not just his own statements that Paul uses. He says, as someone has said, and it turns out this was one of their pagan authors from Athens, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. Well, there's a passage that I love. It's found in uh, Ellen White's writings in the Review and Herald for December 2 of 1890. And it says this, every pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. What does that mean? If you want to look it up, it's December 2, 1890, paragraph 15, Review and Herald. What does that mean? Well, what I don't think it means is that he's constantly doing CPR on us. <laughs> Not. I think it's figuratively meaning that his energy, his talents, his creative powers have put the enzymes, the metabolic process, and everything together in our bodies that work. The electrical works and so forth. He's the one who makes it all work. And if he suddenly stepped back and said, my laws don't apply anymore, all of us would be dead. Just like that. <coughs> Isaiah 64 verse 6 tells us that all our righteousness are what? Nothing but filthy rags. Well, look at a couple points in, at the beginning of Proverbs 30 and at the end of Proverbs 30. These are the solemn words of Agur, son of Jekah, 
God is not with me, God is not with me, I am, and I am helpless. I am more like an animal than a human being. I do not have the sense a human being should have. I have never learned any wisdom, and I know nothing at all about God. That sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, look at the end of the chapter. If you have been foolish enough to be arrogant and plan evil, stop and think. If you churn milk, you get butter. If you hit someone's nose, it bleeds. If you stir up anger, you get into trouble. He's just giving some illustrations. You know, if you do something, it will have consequences. And we know it. In most cases, if you stop and ask people, you know what's going to happen if you do that? Yeah, I know what's going to happen. Why are you doing it? Well, hmm. Right? We don't very often do really foolish things and we don't have any idea what's going to be the result. When people drink, do they know what's going to happen? Yeah. Yes. Well, Most of them do anyway. <laughs> with all our limitations then, is it really foolish to act arrogantly, to be proud? Lucifer was the first one who was proud. Look what got him. Why? I mean, can you imagine someone in the very presence of God being proud? It just blows me away. Well, it's, it's important to understand this particular chapter about humility and Moses' comment, what we read about Moses and humility, in light of what happened in the other, what was no, what normally happened in the writings of ancient nations. Now, most of us aren't very well familiar with what the Egyptians wrote or what the Edomites wrote or what the Hittites wrote. But if you look at those things, what do you find? There's never been any failures listed. <laughs> the kings didn't report about their failures, interestingly enough. It was always their victories. Uh, how wise they were, the good things they had to say, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They, they didn't talk about their failures. I wonder why. So in order to, to understand what actually happened in ancient history, you had to get both sides. You, would have, to, you, know, have, to, you have to get the, the story, what the Israelites wrote about it and what the Edomites wrote about it. You have to get what the Israelites wrote about it and what the Egyptians wrote about it. And then you see both sides and you can, you can try to put the story together. Well... And, and, and don't, don't think that the Bible writers are beyond that. Solomon himself is recorded as surpassing all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom, 1 Kings 10, 23. Can you think of anybody else who was really proud and ended up being a fool? King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar, whoa. What happened to him? Grass like yeah. the beasts of the field. Eating grass like the beasts. I wonder he could survive on it. I bet he lost a lot of weight. He had a psychotic break. He had a psychotic break. Well, look at Daniel 4, verse 30. He said, Look how great Babylon is. I built it as my capital city to display my power and might, my glory and majesty. One of the incredible things about that story to me is that someone else apparently ruled Babylon for seven years. We don't have any idea who that was. And incredible as it may seem, when Nebuchadnezzar came back and seemed to have his right mind again, they handed it over. They handed it over. I mean, that's completely <coughs> beyond what we would normally expect from Could that have been Daniel that ruled during that time? Don't you? I don't think so. Uh -huh. Don't you think that God probably was uh, making sure Nebuchadnezzar didn't die as far as subsisting on grass? Yeah. Cattle do well, but then they've got a whole different internal system, yeah. don't they? Now, whoever it was kept Daniel up high, though. And yeah. yeah. So there well, must have been a positive, some sort of positive spirit going there. Keep this is on. what happened in Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 4, 33 to 30. Seven, let me read that. The words came true immediately. Ne this is God's prediction about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was driven out of human society and ate grass like an ox. The dew fell on his body and his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails as long as bird's claws. When the seven years had passed, said the king, I looked up to the, at the sky and my sanity returned. I praised the supreme God and gave honor and glory to the one who lives forever. He will rule forever and his kingdom will last for all time. He looks on the people of the earth as nothing. Angels in heaven and people on earth are under his control. 
No one can oppose his will or question what he does. When my sanity returned, my honor, my majesty, and the glory of my kingdom were given back to me. My officials and my noblemen welcomed me, and I was given back my royal power with even greater honor than before. And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, honor, and glorify the King of Heaven. Everything he does is right and just, and he can humble anyone he, who acts proudly. And Nebuchadnezzar certainly knew the reality of that, didn't he? And so why don't we have the record of the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar and his missionaries going out and so on? Well, I have another question for you that's maybe related to that. Do you expect to see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven? If this is how he ended. Yeah, there's a good chance. Sounds pretty good there at the end, doesn't it? Well, it's interesting that the, you know what the Hebrew word for foolishness is? Nabal. Do you know anybody by the name of Nabal? Nabal's vineyard. <laughs> no, that was, uh, oh, no. that was somebody else. This was, Nabal was the one who was married to Abigail. And, and remember in those days he had thousands of sheep and, and, and cattle. And David and his men, because they had basically nothing else to do, were out there defending his sheep and cattle so that people couldn't steal them and so forth. And when it came time for shearing the sheep, David sent some men over and said, you know, we've been taking care of your people and preventing them from having all kinds of problems, and we'd like a little share in the, in the prophet. And Nabal said, who's David? I don't pay any attention to this guy. I don't know. That guy. And what happened to him? A few days later, he got soused, he got completely drunk, and died. Mm -hmm. That was real wisdom, wasn't it? You know, Celebrating his harvest. We hear that people in ghettos and some places uh, expect money for protection. Is that what David was doing? Was he actually protecting them? Or was he going to do damage if they didn't pay money? No, no. I, I think we look back to the story of Abraham. He had 318 trained soldiers. What was the, what was the use of those trained soldiers? He wasn't looking to go to war. He had trained soldiers because he needed those many people to protect his flocks. I mean, think here's, here's somebody wandering up and down, or, or even in Nabal's day, you know, someone who lived on the, on, the, on the edges of society. What's to keep thieves from coming and driving off a hundred cows or a hundred sheep just as easily as that? You've got to have, some, you gotta have somebody out there to protect them. Well, then how do you maintain those men, too? Well, I mean, I mean that's a, that's a you, second question. Yeah. I mean, if they weren't getting paid or anything, how yeah. do they stay alive? How do they get their yeah. their clothing and, and all that? Well, that was David's question. We did all this for you. Well, the, the only problem was this, that, that they didn't really make a deal at the beginning. At he the just beginning, no. did it. No. We don't and do that. They traded back then, I'm sure. Jesus had a parable about people that didn't, I mean, he, he stuck with the deal. And uh, people thought they would get more money because they had worked the longest. I uh, look at these words from the Apostle Paul in the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 11. I'm starting with verse 18. And Paul, of course, is writing to which church? This is Corinth. But since there are so many who boast for merely human reasons, I will do the same. You yourselves are so wise and so, so you gladly tolerate fools. You, I mean, this is Paul being just as, about as, you know, he's not being sarcastic. I guess he's being, what would you call that? You tolerate anyone who orders you about or takes advantage of you or traps you or looks down on you or slaps you in the face. I am ashamed to admit that we were too timid to do those things. But if anyone dares to boast about something, I am talking like a fool. I will be just as daring. Now, what? how would you respond if you were prancing around church claiming you were the big guy in the church and so forth and you hear this message. Are they Israelites? Oh, no. Are they Hebrews? So am I. This is Paul talking. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they Christ's servants? I sound like a madman, but I'm a better servant than they are. I've worked much harder. I've been in prison more times. I've been whipped much more and I've been near death more often. Five times I was given the 39 lashes by the Jews. Forty lashes was supposed to kill you. Three times I was whipped by the Romans. Once I was stoned. 
I, and this is before the shipwreck that we know anything about or any of the persecution. That we, this is all written before any of the stuff that we know about. Uh, and many travels, uh, let's see, I have been in three shipwrecks and once I spent 24 hours in the water. In my many travels, I have been in danger from floods and from robbers, in danger from fellow Jews and from Gentiles. There have been dangers in the cities, dangers in the wilds, dangers on the high seas, and dangers from false friends. There has been, hun uh, there has been work and toil. Often I have gone without sleep. I have been hungry and thirsty. I have often been without enough food, shelter, or clothing, and not to mention other things. Every day I am under the pressure of my concern for all the churches. When someone is weak, then I feel weak too. When someone is led into sin, I am filled with distress. If I must boast, I will boast about the things that show how weak I am. Does that sound like some of the other boasting things we read about? The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, blessed be his name forever, knows that I am not lying. When I was in Damascus, the governor un under the King Aretas placed guards at the city gates to arrest me, but I was let down in a basket through an opening in the wall and escaped from him. Now, why is Paul saying all that? Well, that was my question for you. Why is he saying all that? There were other people in the church that had come along. These were what, what he later calls Judaizers and say, we're, we're the real Jews. We're circumcised. We're Hebrews. We're all these things. You need to follow us. Forget the things that Paul taught you. And this is Paul's response. He's, he's kind of pricking them to let the hot air out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Stick I up. wonder originally if there was quite a bit of humor in that also. Yeah. Because um, when you do the translation, you know, the humor kind of goes away and it sounds more serious. But oh. um, when you start talking about yourself, it, it, it sounds like you're kind of blowing your own horn if you, if you don't do it so, a way that well, doesn't... These guys were over there in Corinth blowing their horn to the top as loud as they could. And Paul says, well, if you really want to know, compare them to me. Here's what I have done. Mm -hmm. and, and those guys would say, um, um, you know, what would you say after listening to a story like that? And what about this story? This is a very familiar one in Luke 18. Come on, guys. Jesus also told this parable to people who were sure of their own goodness and despised everybody else. Once there were two men who went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood apart by himself and prayed, I thank you, God, that I'm not greedy, dishonest, or an adulterer like everybody else. He probably was, but he wasn't admitting it. I thank you. No, I wasn't a part of the scripture. I thank you that I'm not like that tax collector over there. I fast two days a week. I give my, a tenth of all my income, give you a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even raise his face to heaven, but beat on his breast and said, God, have pity on me, a sinner. I tell you, said Jesus, the tax collector and not the Pharisee was in the right with God when he went home. For all who make themselves great will be humble, humbled, and all who humble themselves will be made great. Where are we? Are we Pharisees or are we tax collectors? We are born, every one of us is born completely self-centered. The only thing babies can think about is their own needs. And they expect someone to wait on them hand and foot. Myra, no. did that, did that, did your daughter that you were taking care of recently, I mean your granddaughter recently you were taking care of, expect full-time attention? Yeah. Oh yes. More than full-time. More than full-time. More than full-time <laughs> attention, okay. I was more than happy to give it. Yeah. Well, so how, how do we overcome that self-centered attitude? And if there are people who never overcome that, should we feel sorry for them? A lot of those people who are boasting just vociferously on TV and stuff like they've got personality problems. Now, empathy for another, is that in the frontal lobes? Mm -hmm. Empathy for another? So how do we teach our children empathy for another? There's only one way that I know that that's possible, and that's they have to see you do it again and again and again. Mm. Yeah. Well, when you're boring, you're not really capable of doing anything for anybody else. 
Maybe. I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you're there. You're just a little bundle of alarms. Mm -hmm. That's basically what you are. Yeah. And so, um, saying that that's selfishness, I just wonder if that's just kind of the, the, the program here. Well, think about what we've said so far. If we really get to know God, shouldn't that wipe out any tendency to boasting? I mean, you know, where are we compared to him? Isn't that all our world does is boast? A lot of On TV, of in songs, everywhere, mm -hmm. it's boasting. Well, we've now suggested that God created everything. He sustains everything. What do we have to boast about? The laws which scientists study and which they use to do their experiments were made by him. Now, the scientists may not admit that, but that's true. Is there a difference between telling the truth and boasting? Mm. Or someone telling about their accomplishment. Uh, is it boasting because of the intent behind the telling? Especially uh, because of the intent behind yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure God doesn't intend, us to, intend for us to lie to, to sound more humble. Um, when... when professionals, I know I've had to do it, and Gordon, you have to write out your CV, your accomplishments, things that you have mm -hmm. done. It's somewhat hard to do that when you think, well, you know, but there's certain facts are facts, mm -hmm. and people need to know those things, but it's how you, your intent and how you're doing it. Yeah, how you go about doing it. Well, look at Proverbs 30, verses 3 to 6. Here's our eager guy. I have never learned any wisdom, and I know nothing at all about God. Now, does this sound like the guy that ought to be writing a part of the scripture? No. <laughs> Who has ever mastered heavenly knowledge? Oh, that's a good question. Who has ever caught the wind in his hand? Or wrapped up water in a piece of cloth? Or fixed the boundaries of the earth? Who is he, if you know? Who is his son? God keeps every promise he makes. He is like a shield for all who seek his wisdom. I'm sorry, seek his protection. If you claim that he said something that he never said, he will reprimand you and show that you are a liar. Look at uh, the longest section in the Bible where God sort of talks to us directly as human beings, as far as I know, is in Job 38 to 40. What's going on in those chapters? Comparing the infinite with the finite. A lot of people came to Job and, and pretended like they could explain everything about God. They knew God and they knew what ought to be and they knew what was right and what was wrong. And God finally says, hold on, let me speak a few words here. Is God saying, you don't know me? And then does God start explaining who he is? If we even begin to understand the incredible complexity of our universe, we must bow in humility before the God who is able to do all of that. Yes. We do not even begin to have answers to some of the toughest of scientific questions. And I would remind you that back in the late 30s and 40s, 1930s and 1940s, a group of the world's most brilliant men got together on a huge scientific project, and the result was atomic producing bomb. a nu nuclear weapon, atomic bomb. And what did they do in that? In, in that process, they figured out how going through a complicated whole routine of stuff that if you squeeze certain elements tight enough together, they would blow apart, they would explode, and you can destroy cities. And what they actually did was destroy a tiny little bit of matter. They turned it back into energy. Now, think about what happens when God creates something. What does he do? He takes his personal energy and he compresses it millions of times and makes matter. In other words, God has the ability to reverse a nuclear reaction. Mm. Probably just as potent, too. Mm -hmm. 
Well, look at Proverbs 30, verses 7 and 9. This is the only prayer recorded in the book of Proverbs. I ask you, God, to let me have two things before I die. Keep me from lying, and let me be neither rich nor poor. So give me only as much food as I need. If I have more, I might say that I do not need you. But if I am poor, I might steal and bring disgrace on my God. Mm -hmm. Do you ever pray like that? No. Who wrote that? <laughs> Anger, as far as we know. Do we pray to help, ask God to help us not to lie? Do we, do we really ever pray, don't make me rich? Yeah. As human beings, are we prone to cheating and lying? Is that a common human characteristic? You watch, you watch a TV program, some of the most successful movies. I almost never watch movies. I don't have time for it. But you watch some of the, especially comedies. They're often based on the idea that someone just lies and lies and lies and lies, and then he gets caught. You know, what, what are we teaching our children when they watch such things? Even Saturday morning cartoons, that's what they're all about. Yeah? Yeah, somebody outdoing somebody else. It does no good to lie to God. Why? He knows the truth. <laughs> he, knows every, he knows all the details of our lives, or even our thoughts and our motives. So, I mean, there, when we pray, there's no, it, it does no good to try to pretend something different than the, the facts. God knows the facts. It's, you know, what are you trying to tell me? <laughs> you know? <clears throat> Is that why David prayed, God, give me a clean heart? Yeah. So that his thoughts and motives would be in alignment with God? Well, if we, if we, if we look at the situation, God gives us even the food we eat. Without God's blessing, we would have nothing. We wouldn't even survive. You know, that's Proverbs 30, verse 8. It's Genesis 129. In the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily what? Bread. Bread. Well, one of the sins of the teenage years, and I, we should have some teenage years, so teenagers here to stand up for their rights. Well, one of the sins of the teenage years is to question the wisdom of their parents. Now, unfortunately, I will have to admit that there are a lot of parents, including myself, who maybe need to have their wisdom questioned. But, <laughs> but you know, the idea... But the Bible has some very clear things to say about that. Look, look at some of them. Proverbs 30, which is what we're studying right now, says, and I quote, look at verse 11 and 17. There are people who curse their fathers and do not show the, their appreciation for their mothers. Verse 11. Verse 17. Those who make fun of their father or despise their mother in her old age ought to be eaten by vultures or have their eyes picked out by wild ravens. Wow. That's pretty blunt, isn't it? But you know what it says in Exodus 20, verse 12, this, the fifth commandment, respect your father and your mother so that you may live a long time in the land that I'm giving you. And Ephesians 6, 2 and 3 talks about respecting our parents. Respect your father and mother. It's the first commandment that has a promise added so that all may go well with you and you may have a, live a long time in the land. What happens but, if you don't have a good father and mother and you actually have to step away so that you can develop into a good person. You better do a lot of praying. I mean, the Bible doesn't address that. Well, here's what the Bible says about people who disrespect for their parents. Exodus 21, right after the Ten Commandments, verse 15, whoever hits his father or his mother is to be put to death. And Exodus 21, verse 17, whoever curses his father or his mother is to be put to death. Moses didn't beat around the bush. Do you think that's penalty? What would happen if God... What's interesting, Moses didn't know who his father was. And his idea. mother was his stepmother. Not Moses, no. Because wasn't he... Oh, I see the one... Well, his wow. Egyptian parents. But he knew he was... He lived with his real parents until age 12. 12 yeah. Oh, I thought it was just his mother. No, no, he lived with his real parents until he was 12. Okay. Um... Look at a couple of other verses. Look at verse 12 and verse 20 of Proverbs 30. There are people who think they are pure when they are as filthy as they can be. And look at verse 20. This is how an unfaithful wife acts. She commits adultery, has a bath, and says, I haven't done anything wrong. 
go. I wonder if Solomon, Ager, I wonder if these guys knew anything about that from personal experience. <laughs> is, is that why we need to be very sincere about confessing our sins? Think about the Laodiceans. We sometimes think of ourselves as the, the church of the Laodiceans. They had a medical school. They were very wealthy, lots of business stuff, banking and so forth there. Uh, they were famous for producing a kind of black wool. They made all garments out of black wool. They were famous for all that. And what did God tell them they needed? By the way, the medical school is famous for its eye salve. God says, you need my eye salve, my gold, and white raiment. Revelation 3. Are 14. you saying it is very difficult for us to look at ourselves through God's eyes? Mm-hmm. I mean, how then are we to get wisdom yeah. if it's hard for us to do this? What do you do with these verses? Proverbs 30, verses 13 and 14. There are people who think they are so good. Oh, how good they think they are. There are people who take cruel advantage of the poor and needy. That is the way they make their living. Those two go together? Well, they're related. Have you ever felt contempt for someone who thinks they are superior to you? That's not a good situation, I can tell you. Do we ever treat others like that? Do any of us have the right to feel that we are superior? I mean, I'm a doctor, right? Now, there's whole protocols in the business world and you have to study cultures so that you act so that um, you don't put on the air of superiority and offend another person. Yeah. I mean, there's whole codes that different mm -hmm. cultures have. There's also, realistically, there is what is called the great chain of beings. A doctor is, you know, can do more than, uh, you know, the person, the grave digger or what have you. But it doesn't, but the core value, I think that's what they're talking about, but I think mm -hmm. everyone understands, like uh, not every single person is at exactly the same mm -hmm. exact level in their capacity of, to do things. But Does we're all God, brothers and sisters in yeah, the eyes of God. Yeah, absolutely. Doesn't God say we're many parts, we make up the body of God, and some of the not seen lesser parts are actually more important? Well, we take better care of them somehow, don't we? <laughs> well. Agar goes on to mention ants, rock badgers, locusts, and lizards. Would you pick those things out as great examples of lessons about God? Ants, yes, if you understand how they go about doing things. Well, what about rock badgers? <laughs> Don't know enough about them to Me tell either. you. <laughs> well, they, they manage to survive. They store up, I mean, they're storing up like mad. If you watch them, they're storing up stuff. They, they, they hide it among the deep in the rocks in the high mountains where it's covered with snow. And when the snow comes, they just move back into their K little cave places and eat the food they've been storing all summer. What about the locusts? They all move together like an organized army. What about lizards? He says lizards are, are amazing. You, you can pick them up in your hand. They, 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 you know, so you, could, you could destroy them very easily, but they live in the palaces of kings. <laughs> we used to have a, I lived in Africa for many years, and, and um, our windows out there were designed so that you could open them this way uh, to let some, some cool air in, but you had to have a screen on the outside, so there was a space between the shuttered windows and the outside and we always used to keep uh, chameleons and sometimes praying mantises and that space between them because they would catch the other bugs and eat them like our children love to watch the there he goes watch him watch him it's a great <laughs> it's great fun to watch a chameleon catch bugs yeah, that 18 inch tongue and that huge long tongue of <laughs> how did you get the praying mantis how did you catch it to oh catch it you know with a net or Get a hold Those of it. are the cutest little things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my wife went to somebody's house in Texas and 
And she was surprised all the lizards that were running around mm. in the bedroom. <laughs> well, there's lots of geckos, probably. Yeah. Um, maybe one of the most important reasons why we call Solomon wise is because he recognized how important humility was. If our most important task, let's think about us now. If our most important task in life is getting to know God, how should we feel about his revealed word? We should think that it's a gift from him. Respect it. How do we get to know him? Through that word. To his revealed word, right? So when we pick up a Bible, or we, I would say also maybe some of the material from Desire of Ages or something like that, when you pick up that stuff that we believe is inspired by God, what are we saying? We're saying here we have in our hands a representation of God. We should be very, very careful how we, we deal with those kinds of things. Ellen White said in the book Education, page 244, we should reverence God's Word. For the printed volume, we should show respect, never putting it to common uses or handling it carelessly. And never should Scripture be quoted in a jest or paraphrased to point out a witty saying. Every word of God is pure as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Proverbs 30, verse 5, and Psalm 12, verse 6. <coughs> and then another place, the Lord can do nothing toward the recovery of man until convinced of his own weakness and stripped of all self-sufficiency, he yields himself to the control of God. Then he can receive the gift that God is waiting to bestow. From the soul that feels his need, nothing is withheld. He, had, he has unrestricted access to him in whom all fullness dwells. Desire of Ages 299 and 300. So what does that tell us? Our, our gateway to knowing God are, are the door that opens the truth about God is the Bible the Bible but we've got to be very humble as how we approach it don't we we've got to say okay and, and what's the problem so often so often we think well I know better than that what I know is, is you know I figured things out I, I don't I don't need God's God's guidance here. Uh, we know Great Controversy 555. I hope you've all learned it or even memorized it. Uh, by beholding, we become changed. And it goes on to describe the implications of that. Even 2 Corinthians 3.18. All of us then reflect the glory of the Lord with uncovered faces. So if we really get to know God, we should reflect His glory. And that same glory coming from the Lord, it's not our glory, it's His glory, who is the Spirit, transforms us into His likeness in an ever greater degree of glory. Who does it? God. He does it. What does He want to do? He wants to transform us into His likeness. Wow. Well, the Bible study guide for this week in the teacher section, it says, we are obviously very poor and humble and can't do much for ourselves, so we need a substitute. Someone who legally stands in our place and whose righteousness alone is enough to make us right with God. How does the righteousness of Jesus make us right with God? Don't everybody talk at the same time. <laughs> Because righteousness and God are the same thing. Now, this is something we should know. I think we know. The righteousness <laughs> and God are the same thing. Think, guys. Right. Righteousness and God are the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So, how Jeez. does His righteousness make us right? So, we, I mean, I understand how He is righteous and He's right, but what, how does that make us right? He came here and lived a perfect life. To show that it could be done. Mm -hmm. It could be done, but how? Just not only that, to show not only what God is like, but to show what God is not like. In other words, to answer all Satan's accusations and prove that all his claims are false. He did all of that. 
Now, when Jesus went back to heaven, he sent us the Comforter, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit, who is supposed to help us live the life that Jesus lived, correct? That sounds like a good idea. And we only do that by following our reading the Bible and following on what we know we should do. As we read earlier, if we learn about God more and more as we study His Word, what happens? We, as we allow God to have access to our brains, He will make the changes. He makes the changes. We don't do it. He does it. But He wants to, well, we just read it right there. He wants to transform us to be in His image. And where some people go wrong is they say, I do not want to be transformed. I want to drink my vodka. Yeah. I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And so then God cannot, He can only take you so far. And somehow you think God's life will not be as fun as don't maybe getting think, drunk or something. Don't you think that wanting your vodka is another thing that God can take care of? Yes, he can take care of if you want him to take care of it. But even if you want him to take care of it, don't you think that's something that God can yes, take Yes, he can of? take care of if you want him so to. So where does it end? <laughs> well, and, and you know, I deal with people who smoke and drink all the time. That's part of our patient mix that we get all the time. Mm -hmm. But I can guarantee you that if you don't want to stop smoking or you don't want to stop drinking, you won't. But there's still a good news there that you can tell the people that don't want to go to God, He will help you not want to. So we yeah. need a substitute. Sounds like legal, a legal phrase, mm -hmm. rather than my view of God as being what we try to emulate, what we do our best to, and that uh, he, you think He He wants to save everyone who will be willing to be with him. You think that you can relate to God without a lawyer? Hopefully. My I try to do a lot of things without lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> My view now, of this is oh. that the way it's depicted here that Christ is standing up in front, mm -hmm. in front of us. And I picture it that way, but he's standing there in front of Satan saying, this person wants to go the right direction and I'm here to say it's possible because he wants, he wants Myra my wants my help. One of the things we should learn from God is that he has two great books to teach us from. We have the Bible we've been talking about. What about the book of nature? Yes. Would we, would our children be better off if they spent more time in nature and less time with their electronic devices? No question. No question. Isn't electronic devices nature? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, electronics well, you, come from nature. The, well, the I will pictures say, come from nature. I will say <laughs> that, that you can find from the BBC and from sometimes from National Geographic, you would find some fantastic pictures of nature that you would never be able to get yourself. I, I, I'll admit that it's possible to use those media to, to do some fantastic things. But unfortunately, I don't find that as a common thing that kids uh, are focusing on when they... <laughs> and people can use those electronic media to tune to theox.org. They can. That's and a good at, And to read the Bible in multiple translations, multiple languages. There's mm -hmm. no, but the, really, there's no comparison. Yeah. I was looking at my oldest grandson last weekend, and, and he's, a, he's a great kid. But when I was 12, his current age, I had square miles of what had been prime timber country and still was good country to go out on a Sabbath afternoon with my buddies. I could still take you back there today and find, show you where the wild orchids grow in certain parts of that little town that yeah. I can guarantee nobody else knows. Yeah. You don't do that peering down something and all this yeah. jazz. Well, I, I could say the same thing. I grew up in a rural part of northern, Afri uh, northern Idaho and yeah. Well, what does a theory of evolution do to our relationship with God? It strikes right at the root of it. If you start believing that evolutionary stuff, I mean, you don't believe God created us, you don't believe he has anything, he, he, he's not involved with us. That's self-abuse, <laughs> and the, the teaching of it is abusing your kids and everybody. 
How different would the world be if we all actually believed what, wrote, what was written just in this chapter? We believe that everybody should do an honest day's work. Nobody should lie or steal. Wouldn't that be something? A whole lot different. Well, how much does a personal knowledge of God impact our wisdom? It improves it. It broadens it. Yeah. So it can lead to eternal life. Remember that we started out. Oh, go ahead. You asked a question in the in the handout. Could we believe in evolution and still correctly worship God on the Sabbath? Yeah. Do you think you could? No. I don't, don't either. Not if, if you, you really. If I you, develop from the ooze, that's what I worship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. Well. In light of this chapter, we're, we're doing it's almost circling back to the beginning of Proverbs where we started out with what expression? What's the famous expression from Proverbs? The beginning? The fear of the Lord is... The beginning of wisdom. The beginning of wisdom. It's, it, it's in Job 28, verse 28. It's in Psalm 111, verse 10. Proverbs 1, 7, 9, 10. It's repeated several times. Are we beginning to, as we've studied through the book of Proverbs, are we beginning to get some idea of what that, all that implies? Or do we hold the Bible in great respect? Do we study it? Do we allow time to, to spend, do we spend time with God's Word? Well, we have almost no time left. How many of the common social skills are addressed in this chapter? I mean, just this, in, in this chapter, fools are described as simple, gullible, irresponsible, empty-headed, inexperienced, drifting into temptation, and is not accepting discipline, rebuke, or correction. That's not where we want to be, right? One of the best things to learn about God is, the best ways to learn about God is a careful study of nature. The intelligence displayed by many dumb animals approaches so closely to human intelligence that it is a mystery. What man with the human heart who has ever cared for domestic animals could look into their eyes so full of confidence and affection and willingly give them over to the butcher's knife. How could he devour their flesh as a sweet morsel? Well, that's something to think about and we're running out of time. Whoa. <laughs> How's that for a final note? <laughs> Ministry of Healing, page 315 and 316. Look at the context. Mm -hmm. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this privilege to do our best in representing you to those who will have a chance to listen. We hope there will be many and that what we said will be of some help to them is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.